tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We're prepared to do what we need to do to get a deal done. SkyTrain workers serve 72 hour strike notice. Also, the bears were approaching people very closely. Six bears killed in two days. Why conservation officers in Fort Coquitlam say they had no choice but to euthanize them. And how does it feel? Very good. <laughs> job. Opening our doors and going behind the scenes at CBC, all for local food banks. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, thanks for joining us. The day after Metro Vancouver bus drivers and sea bus workers said yes to a new contract, there's more potential trouble tonight for transit users. SkyTrain workers have now issued 72-hour strike notice. The CBC Stan Bird is live at Stadium Chinatown SkyTrain station tonight with more on this. So Dan, when could these workers go off the job? 11 a.m. Monday morning, Anita and Mike. That is after a busy morning commute, but could still affect tens of thousands of people who rely on SkyTrain every day. Now, just to clarify, this potential job action would affect the Expo line, just like Stadium Chinatown here, as well as the Millennium line. The Canada line and West Coast Express would not be affected. The union for 900 or so SkyTrain workers says it issued the strike notice after mediation over four days did not produce any progress to a deal. Wages, forced overtime, and staffing are some of the big issues. Our members are quite disappointed. Um, we've been working very hard and we've told the employer how serious they need to take this bargaining, uh, this round of bargaining, and they just haven't. And, uh, so we felt we needed to... Meanwhile, the BC Rapid Transit Company, which runs SkyTrain, sounds somewhat optimistic in a statement it says we are hopeful and committed to reaching a fair deal without disrupting the valuable service we provide to the residents of this region now much like buses and, and skytrain a lot of people pardon me and buses and sea bus a lot of people rely on skytrain to get to and from work and around for life every day many we talked to earlier today seemed surprised at the news of another potential strike i thought they settled it so what are we going to do for work yeah, it's a big deal. Not happy. I have exams and I'm worried about that. If uh, they go on strike, then what happens? So that's going to cause a bit of a problem. <laughs> it's inconvenient, but I think the workers deserve the wage increase. I'm, I'm confident that they will be able to reach an agreement before, the, before any serious job action happens. Keep in mind, both sides are still in bargaining, and the union is going to outline any potential job action tomorrow at about 11 a.m. Anita, Mike. All right, Dan Burrett live at SkyTrain tonight. Thanks. Okay, the dire situation for salmon runs in the Fraser River could be worse than previously thought. Work on clearing the boulders that slid into the river, blocking it at Big Bar, hasn't even started yet. And as Tanya Fletcher reports, that's raising concerns for next year's run. No, we have over 30 species of fish that reside here in the heart. Dean Work has spent decades fishing along this stretch of the Fraser River. But this is probably one of the most important delicate ecosystem areas of the entire 900 mile Fraser River. But several hundred kilometers upstream, a massive slab of rock crumbled off the side of a cliff, blocking the salmon migration path and triggering an emergency response. Over the summer, helicopters flew tens of thousands of fish up and over the slide in buckets. Crews eventually created a natural passageway so the salmon could swim through on their own. But for some, the rescue operation was too stressful and too late in the delicate spawning cycle. Documents obtained by CBC News now reveal a dire outlook. Government scientists believe there's a meaningful chance of extinction for three salmon runs. Others believe it'll be much worse. We're going to see not three. We may see 10, 15, 20 of the runs potentially being driven into extinction. I cried when I, when I first heard that news. More than 100 First Nations along the Fraser River rely on salmon for food. Some bands have already made alarming observations of their own. They noticed that there were very few uh, salmon up there. In some, uh, in some tributaries there were no, where they used to go and spawn, there were none. 
and fears are already mounting for next season too. The internal report warns there's a good chance natural passage won't be fully restored in time for the 2020 salmon run. And officials are now asking for help. It wasn't until late November the federal government put out a formal request for information. They're looking for ideas from the industry, the private sector and First Nations on ways to get the remaining rocks out of the river. They've known about it sometime in the middle of uh, uh, late spring, summer freshet. And it takes all the way till December to even start procuring contracts. You know, this is, the Canadian military should be in there. The uh, public works uh, uh, guys from uh, federal government should be, they should be, this is a catastrophe. A catastrophe experts worry will spell the end for salmon stocks already knocked to their knees by mother nature. Daniel Fletcher, CBC News, Chilliwack. To Port Coquitlam now, where six bears have been killed in just two days. Conservation officers say they had no choice but to euthanize two families of black bears after months of conflict. And as John Hernandez is finding out, residents are divided over whether the animals should have been saved. For months, Linda Walker and her pup Luna feared what was lurking outside. It gets to the point where you feel like you're a prisoner in your own home because it because the bears have really taken over the neighborhood. Since October, two families of black bears, mothers and cubs, have been in and out of this Port Coquitlam neighborhood looking for food. This video, shot by an area resident, shows the bears taking over a neighborhood park. For the video taker, the bears weren't an issue. People were keeping their distance. They weren't causing a problem. They were just there. There were even people that got, I would say, within 10 feet. But conservation officers didn't agree. These bears should be going into uh, their long periods of sleep cycle. They weren't. Um, the attractiveness of the area was a, a lot greater than that. Officers responded to dozens of sightings and tried to haze the bears out of the area. But the animals kept coming back. People were approaching them very closely. The bears were approaching people very closely. All six were killed by officers late last week. It's a relief to some, but not all. We thought these guys were protecting the bears. Marie Nickel has lived here for decades and was surprised to find out the bears weren't relocated. And they should have transported them back into the bushes where they, they would have survived. Officers say that wasn't an option. Because if they were left unattended here or introduced to another area, they could have been, um, someone could have been hurt. And that would definitely hurt me even further if I had a, a child attacked. Hey! Bear sightings have been on the rise in communities across Metro Vancouver. Officials say there's many reasons, including loss of habitat but it's uncontrolled garbage that draws them into particular neighborhoods. There's development happening all over the Tri-Cities. There's not a lot of places for the bears to go anymore, so they're all being pushed down to the cities. And if people refuse to control their garbage and clean up the, the messes that they have, this is what's going to happen. City staff are urging residents to lock up their garbage and those who don't could face fines. It might take some effort, but it could save a bear's life. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. The man tasked with helping Surrey transition from the RCMP to its own police force says it could take a minimum of two years before the new force is in place. Wally Opel, former judge and attorney general of B.C., says his transition committee is working to establish ground rules and a framework for the new force. He says Surrey will be appointing a new police board and a new police chief, adding that he has, the committee has done nothing yet to determine what the costs will be. He also indicated that he doesn't think public safety will improve with the change. Public safety should be a concern everywhere, but I'm, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if the establishment of a new police force will necessarily uh, may, make a better climate for public safety. But keep in mind that the, the police work hard at what they do, uh, but Surrey has decided that they want their own police force and the province has complied with that request. Opal says it's not for him to decide if it's the right option. A Vancouver police officer was assaulted while trying to remove a passenger on board a bus. The incident happened yesterday evening in the area of Broadway and Heather. Police say a man was allegedly masturbating when two transit officers and a police officer tried to remove him. That's when he got violent and refused to leave. 
He then punched the Vancouver police officer and transit security in the face. He attempted to remove the pistol of the Vancouver police officer, but thankfully was unsuccessful. He was able to remove the police officer's baton, but the officer was able to retrieve it back while in the struggle. The man was arrested and taken to jail. The officer did not suffer any injuries and was back on the job today. Homicide investigators say a dark blue Acura LT has now been linked to the shooting death of an Abbotsford teenager. Jagvir Mali was found suffering from a gunshot wound last year after he'd been shot at an intersection. Later that day, a blue Acura was found burning in Surrey. And police say the two incidents are linked. Investigators believe the suspects took off in a white Mazda shortly after. Mali was a second year student at the University of the Fraser Valley and his friends describe him as a mature role model. Police say Molly did not have a criminal history. Now, our investigation to date has not identified um, Jagveer being associated to any criminality of any kind. But what we've learned is that uh, there were those in his life that were involved in the Lower Mainland gang conflict. Police say the Acura car fire was quickly extinguished and there was barely any damage, allowing them to collect evidence. They've also identified suspects, but no arrests have been made. The Canadian economy has suffered its biggest monthly job loss since the financial crisis. The November numbers from Stats Canada are pushing the unemployment rate higher, up to 5.9%. The economy lost 71,200 jobs across the country last month. BC and Alberta each lost 18,000 jobs. The unemployment rate is now at its highest point since August of 2018. And economists had banked on Canada adding 10,000 jobs and a steady unemployment rate of 5.5%. Well, it was mini madness today as TransLink riders lined up for the launch of the keychain-sized Compass Mini. About 7,500 of the tiny cards were released today. And the Stadium Chinatown Compass office saw just how much demand there is this morning. But 120 people lined up around the corner onto the Dunsmere Viaduct in order to get their hands on the Mini. The last time riders lined up at TransLink offices like this was for the launch of the Compass bracelet. That transit wearable quickly sold out. Well, TransLink will soon be adding tactile and braille signage at bus stops for customers who are blind or partially sighted. It, uh, it opens our gateway to independence to the point where um, we can no longer ha have to worry about getting around the, the, the system. Uh, we know that we'll be able to do it independently and on our own, and that's, that's a giant step forward. Beginning next year, the new signs will be installed at around 8,500 bus stops. Now back in 2012, TransLink installed tactile and braille at various bus stops, including Joyce Collingwood Station, as part of a pilot project. The company will also be looking at ways to help riders better navigate the system using data sent directly to a phone or tablet. The project is expected to cost $7 million. Well, the crowd went wild, and video of the moment has gone viral. Yeah, the reaction is pretty spectacular. All to a grade 12 student from Fort Moody with Down syndrome who scored a buzzer-beater three-point shot at a basketball tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have Tina Lovegreen to Tell show the video. More. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 I did dirty, bro. Victor. Reed, are you famous now? I am, Matt. Uh, the most popular kid in school is Reed DeMello. Yeah, look at you. You're all official, hey? Yeah. Oh my you can gosh. often find him on the court shooting hoops. And while he's not on the school basketball team, he volunteers as the team manager. The last week during a tournament, his classmates were chanting for him to be subbed in. And when he was... Oh boy, did he ever deliver. I feel good. I feel awesome. Why? Because the whole team rushed at me after the game. I love that experience. That video went viral. But you see, it's not because he's internet famous now that everyone knows Reed. He has a personality of his own and he basically makes his own friends. He's just got that extra spark. No matter what kind of day you're having, he'll come up to you and just give you a hug and just, oh, just that, like, that feeling, like, is 
so empowering because he, he's just always there to put a smile on your face. And that smile makes him very popular with the ladies. He's given me flowers numerous times, but then asked for them back because he needed to give them to his other girlfriend. <laughs> what sauce? But on and off the court. Are you left-handed? Yeah. His classmates say he's just always there to cheer you on. You can always see him and it like makes your day really. Like every day he comes in here. If I if I don't see Reader in here, I'm like, oh, why am I still here? Right? Like he's just one of those guys, you know. <laughs> You're handsome too, eh? Yeah, thank you. And so it's not a viral video that makes Reed special or his needs. Can you make your it's what he gives back to his community, yeah, friends and family. Tina Love Green, CBC News, Port Moody. You get tingles when you watch it. Every time I see it, I just feel it's amazing. He's hilarious. Well, you play basketball. I mean, you know how yeah. I've, I've never hit there. a buzzer beater three. No. Come on. Good for you. Good for him. Fantastic stuff. <laughs> All right, today was a big day here at CBC Vancouver, our 33rd annual Open House and Food Bank Day. Yeah, thousands of people pour into our studios here for a peek behind the scenes, all to benefit our local food banks. Deborah Goble has the highlights. Getting into the holiday spirit at the CBC Open House. This is the 33rd annual CBC Open House and Food Bank Day. It's in, throughout British Columbia, and we're raising money for food banks across BC, of which there are 100. Over $10 million raised for BC food banks over the years. It's an awesome feeling because I know that there are people that need it. It's a teleprompter. But this day is about more than just fundraising. It's also about opening the doors and inviting everybody in to see what goes on in the CBC building. This is a great opportunity just to thank our viewers and listeners for supporting the Canada's public broadcaster, but also for supporting the community and being part of the larger community and supporting those who are in need at a time of the year where it's really super necessary to be doing so. I'm all press buttons. I'm a press button too. We got lots and lots of buttons for you kids to see, so we're going to take them into the uh, This is a great <laughs> job for pushing buttons, yes. I really like meeting the people who come to, uh, to say hello. They're always uh, very engaging and curious about what actually goes on in here. Have a seat. There we go. How does it feel? Very good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you're important. Yeah, important. <laughs> Getting to say hi to the audience. Nice to meet you again, nice to see you. The most part of fun is um, meeting people, enjoying, and being new, everything every year is different. They have new layouts and new stuff, and everything will be so good. It's one of the best parts of the CBC Open House and Food Bank Day, a day filled with moments. $539,738. The 33rd annual CBC Open House and Food Bank done is done for another year, but the donations keep coming in. Deborah Goble, CBC News, Vancouver. What a day it was. Yeah, we met, just... We met so many great yeah. people who came in here and just wanted to know all about the CBC. But the best part is everybody donated to the food bank and yeah, we have raised quite a bit of money. Mm, yes, we have. In fact, there's what's oh. been raised so far, 860,000 just over, which is, what was last year's total? Eight. Last year's 823, 823,000. So we're already past. And you can keep donating until January 1st. That's right. Thanks to everybody who donated. Thanks to everybody who uh, came by to say hi at our open house and food bank day today. Wonderful stuff. And Brett, uh, this was your 
very first Open House mm. Food Bank day. It you was were a busy guy today. <laughs> <laughs> I felt really like extra popular today. There were a lot of people playing around on the weather sets, and it was just so encouraging to see so many people come by and, of course, donating that money that is so powerful. So thank you to all of you. If you're watching right now and you came by, it was amazing to meet you. Thank you for swinging by and seeing what the weather is all like. And now, as is tradition, I get to tell you what this weekend has in store. And if this radar and satellite is any indication, you have a rough idea of where I'm going with this. So showers, certainly gonna be the theme, not only for tonight, but yeah, that's gonna go into the weekend. Temperatures though, still on the fairly mild side. We're looking at about eight degrees or so. Not gonna see a big change in that. For the remainder of the overnight period, say for example, post midnight, we're looking at temperatures around six. Tomorrow throughout the day, largely gonna be a story of scattered showers. We're looking at highs about 10 degrees. So this would be fairly mild compared to what we'd expect this time of year, which would be closer to about seven degrees. On Sunday, however, we are gonna be seeing that sun make a triumphant return. It's gonna be coming out in full force by the afternoon, highs around eight. But I do wanna mention one other thing. Elsewhere in the province, while we are gonna be getting showers, we have widespread snowfall warnings. So for anyone in the central interior here, including Prince George, all the way down to Revelstoke, we could be seeing anywhere between 10, maybe even 30 centimeters of snow accumulating by tomorrow morning. That is a foot. So I'm gonna have more on that story when I come back later on the show. All right, Brett, thanks so much. You're welcome. And just a quick reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC GEM, and the free app is also where you find other CBC programs. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Well, memorials across Vancouver were held today to remember the woman killed at Montreal's Ecole Polytechnique 30 years ago. Uh, it's a slogan because... A ceremony was held at the Women's Monument in Thornton Park to honor the 14 murdered women. And UBC hosted Beam of Light ceremonies at uh, the Chan Center for Performing Arts. It was part of a series of Beam of Light ceremonies being held across Canada. We'll have more coverage on the memorials later in our show. All right, thanks for staying with us online during the television commercial break. As always, extra content for you at this time of our program. Okay, I think it's fair to say O Canada is one of the country's most yeah. familiar tunes. So. <laughs> and of course, many students across the country start their day in school by singing it. But in a growing number of schools, they are changing the words. Katerina Georgieva shows us why. The melody is the same, but this version of the national anthem is in the Ojibwe language. At McNaughton Avenue Public School, it started in this grade two classroom. We took a look at the national anthem to see what's the difference in thinking. Teacher Beth Gellner turned to an educator from Walpole Island First Nation. When you read the lyrics as they're translated um, from Ojibwe to English, you'll notice that there's a lot of focus on loving the land and loving creation and honoring all of creation. So not a direct translation from English, rather a lyric reflecting indigenous values. The kids made these drawings to show their understanding of that message. Sands Gamble says this means a lot to students from nearby First Nations. It's so important and empowering for students to hear their language and their stories. And it resonates with non-indigenous students too. My favorite part is Nanibida Miguetiwendanda. And that means stand up, let us say thank you. After working with the grade twos, Gellner got a school choir to record the new anthem. And now its Ojibwe version is played at morning announcements. People around here, this is their territory, speak Ojibwe, so we should have it. Other schools in southwestern Ontario with large Indigenous populations think so too. At this one, near Walpole Island First Nation, Indigenous students say it means a lot to them. It makes them feel like they're not forgetting about like our culture and who we are as people. Just to be able to hear it makes me feel special and I belong here. Now, Sands Gamble says she's getting calls from other teachers to help them with the anthem in Ojibwe as well. Katerina Georgieva, CBC News, Chatham, Ontario. We're going to have to learn it. They've got to change the words. they got to change the words. Yeah, there you go. I, it would be very difficult to learn, but great. I'm Fantastic. all for it.
Okay, we're going to be back in just a couple of seconds with more out of Montreal and across the country on the 30th anniversary of the massacre at Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal. Stay with us. This was the scene in Montreal tonight. 14 beams of light shine skyward, honoring the victims of the 1989 Ecole Polytechnique attack, each beam representing a life lost that tragic day. This evening, hundreds took part in a vigil on top of Montreal's Mont Royal to remember the women who died. It's hard to overstate the shock and terror of that day when a gunman entered the school and killed 14 women. Many Canadians say they still feel the trauma. And today, 30 years later, hundreds gather to honor those lives. As Alison Northcott explains, it was the culmination of a day of intense emotion. This is where the trauma began 30 years ago at Ecole Polytechnique. She hid herself, but uh, since she was uh, blonde with long hair, I probably he, he spotted her. It's where Catherine Bergeron's sister, Geneviève, was killed. We used to call her our sunshine. Uh, very, very talented in a lot of uh, field and very kind. Bergeron says she and her sister grew up believing women could be anything they wanted. Everything was possible. And then when this happened, did that? I understood that, and not, that it was not that. The ceremony tonight drew people touched by the event in many ways, some so closely. Stéphane Chaillet was in the classroom when Marc Lapine walked in. I remember him shooting in the, on the wall. I remember us panicking, not knowing what we had to do. Over the years, he says his perspective on what happened has changed. It was maybe easier to think that it was just a, an individual that had mental hiddenness. So it took me maybe 20 years to realize what this was all about. And what is that? I think it's, it was about violence against women. I am an engineer through and through. Governor General Julie Payette said there's still a need to call out the sexism that remains today. To the belittling, the dehumanizing, the name calling that we observe so often, especially to any women who raise her head above the crowd. We have to speak up and say no. Nathalie Croteau. And then 14 beams of light lit up the sky, one for each of the victims. 30 years ago, these women, respective lives and destinies were shattered, which has left us with the obligation to reflect on this loss. I graduated in mechanical engineering and like, I feel that I have the future that those girls won't have. <laughs> 30 years later, on a day that looks just as it did then, it is as raw as it ever was. CBC's Alison Northcott reporting from Montreal. Journalist Francine Peltier was one of the women the shooter had on a list of feminists he wanted to kill. She says she thinks it has taken a long time for the country to understand what happened that night. Obviously, Marc Lupin had a terrible axe to grind. He was a classic mass murderer in, in that respect, you know, white young male with, who, who has decided he is not getting his just desserts and he's going to make people pay. And in his case, he was going to make women pay because he, had, he obviously hated not just women, he hated feminism, which I think is the, the thing we've missed uh, mostly all these years. Uh, uh, it took us a long time to even acknowledge here in Quebec that this was indeed a crime against women, that this was uh, an act of terrorism. He was aiming women because they were women. But he was actually aiming women because he wanted to send a message uh, of anti-feminism. And I think it took us, well, until now, actually, 
to really look that in, in the eye. And today's grim anniversary is also a chance to look at the future and encourage young women pursuing a career in engineering. This week, the annual Order of the White Rose Scholarship was presented in memory of the 14 lives lost. Suda Krishnan has that story. In a building that was once the scene of sorrow, it was a day to celebrate. And honor one young woman in particular, a 23-year-old with a passion for science. I feel so humble, but also I, I'm very happy. Edith Ducham is this year's Order of the White Rose recipient. The 23-year-old is the fifth young woman to receive this $30,000 honor. I would like to take your hand. Since 2014, it's been awarded every year to a female Canadian engineering student pursuing graduate studies. You are now five fairies, five beautiful women. For survivor Nathalie Provo, the scholarship has special meaning. You symbolize the interrupted dreams of my classmates. Down the road at Place du 6 Décembre, a memorial sign has changed to call what that shooting was 30 years ago an attack on women, a night that haunts former student Stéphane Rouillon to this day. Nous avons été séparés. We were separated, he says. One of the first women graduates in engineering believes the attack was anti-feminist, but the school never was. We're like a big, big family, and I think I know why. Uh, studying engineering is, is quite demanding. Women here at Polytechnic are precious. The women of the past, and the leaders of tomorrow, including Duchamp. Her dream is to revolutionize laser surgery, but most of all. Well, it's really a promise for me and for the women that were killed that I'm going to pursue their dream and be the mo best model, role model that I can be. So the Christian in CBC News, Montreal. A lot of work goes in behind the scenes to CBC Open House and Food Bank Day. After the break, meet the woman who has been the force behind it all for 33 years.
A quick look at some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. So we felt we needed to uh, issue the 72-hour strike notice to let them know that our members are completely serious on doing what they need to do to get a deal done. 900 SkyTrain workers will be in a legal strike position as early as Monday as they issue strike notice. The union says it will reveal its job action plans tomorrow. Also tonight, the dire situation for salmon runs in the Fraser River could be worse than previously thought. Work on clearing the boulders that slid into the river, blocking it at Big Bar, hasn't even started yet, and that's raising concerns for next year's run. These bears were unsafe and unsuitable to relocate. Six bears killed in two days. Conservation officers in Fort Coquitlam say they had no choice but to euthanize two families of black bears after months of conflict. Residents are divided over whether the animals should have been saved. Well, this is Open House and Food Bank Day here at CBC Vancouver. Of course, we throw open our doors to you so you can come see what we do here behind the scenes. We're also raising money for local food banks right across BC. Anita spoke today to the woman behind it all. Have a look. There are a lot of people behind the scenes here at CBC Open House and Food Bank Day that really make all of this happen. And one of the key people is Anne Penman. She's been with this day for 33 years. Hi, Anne. Hi, Anita. We are with you in the phone room. This is where all the donations are collected. And today has been absolutely electric. What stood out to you? Um, I think it's just the uh, goose flesh you get with just the generosity of the CBC audience. People calling in all day, donating online, uh, small amounts, huge amounts, uh, and uh, just how generous people are and helping people in need. You've been doing this for such a long time, and I'm sure everybody's always wondering how you keep it going year after year, but it really is amazing. What does it mean to you personally? Um, I think personally it just is my way of, uh, with a, a huge number of our colleagues, as you know, it's a real team effort this day here at CBC um, British Columbia. So I think it's just um, getting people together to um, sort of sometimes put a little bit of our work aside and help other people in the community. So I think we all get a really good feeling. And there's 60 volunteers here in the phone room over the course of the day from 6 in the morning till 6 at night. And they all leave with a real sense of energy and a sense that they've uh, done something to help people. And there are so many spots to be at CBC on this day. Why do you choose to be in the, the phone room? I, I think it's the heartbeat of, uh, of our fundraiser is right here in the phone room. It's where the audience are, the people are phoning and uh, pledging and talking a little bit to our volunteers about the CBC. So um, it, to me, it's the heartbeat. I want to point out one more thing. I interview Anne uh, almost every year, and there's always something that stands out for me. Usually it's the fact that she's wearing runners. Today you're wearing slippers. Yes, these are my slippers. Don't don't zoom in too closely. They're from home. Uh, but yeah, my feet are killing me. I've been here since 4.30 in the morning. you got to stay comfortable. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a lot of running around this phone room that happens. Thank you for all that you do, Anne. Yeah, thank you, Anita. We really can't emphasize enough. Anne is a force. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And when she says her feet are tired, she really is on her feet for weeks come yeah. leading up to this. Leading up to it. She's allowed yeah. to wear slippers, yeah. for sure. It's fantastic. Uh, we have a total, a uh, new total here, $860,838. That's fantastic. Everything going to local food banks around the province. And you can still donate, right? Up until January 1st yeah. online. Fantastic. Make it happen. Thanks to everybody who donated and everybody who... Stop by to say hello today. 6.38, Friday night, a live look downtown this evening. Kind of soggy out there. Pretty dull day on the south coast. But the weekend is here, and part of it is looking pretty good. Brett will tell us which part next.
All right, Brett is here, and although we're getting some rain tomorrow, I hear Sunday's supposed to be half decent. Yes, there's going to be a nice little trade-off. I mean, obviously, as Mike knows, my tradition is that Saturday's here in Vancouver. Well, they have to be rainy. Come on, we got to keep the record usually going. Usually, too. Sundays have been definitely a little bit rainy as well, but this one will be a nice exception. I think that sun should come out, and it'll be a nice day to get out and enjoy it. But here, let's take a look from this morning to see what you can be expecting tomorrow morning. That's right. We're going to be looking at a very similar setup as we saw this morning. Lots of clouds in the sky. There come the showers. It's almost like it's predicting the future for what we're going to be seeing in a mere 12 hours from now. No real significant change there into the forecast. And, you know, I was mentioning earlier that uh, though we'll be getting some rain here, snow is really the dominant story for the vast majority of our province. And this really is crucial for any traveling going on. So I do want to reiterate 10 to 30 centimeters of snow is expected throughout the next 12 hours or so. We have a really big system that's making its way onshore right now. And that's the thing here responsible for this huge band of snow, anywhere from the central coast all the way through Prince George down to Williams Lake. And even by tomorrow morning, we're going to be seeing yet even more snow for Revelstoke and Golden. So as a skier, this looks pretty great. But as a traveler, this is definitely not ideal. So do keep that in mind if you're going to be going out there into the interior and doing any travel on those mountain passes. But closer to home, for the next few hours, getting into the late evening, into the overnight period, we're going to see those showers off and on, kind of continuing tomorrow, especially into the morning and early afternoon, that's when we're going to see some of the heavier showers probably turn into full-on rain. But as we get into the late afternoon into the evening, that's going to be clearing up, and those guys in general come Sunday are going to be sharing a few breaks of sun with us. Overall, I can say that for the late weekend and into next week, we're going to be seeing a nice clearing trend all the way across BC and into parts of Alberta. We've got high pressure that's going to be dominating, so no matter where you are in the province of BC, by the start of next week, it's looking pretty pretty good. And on that note as well, temperatures are going to be really behaving. And I choose that word because we're not looking at a lot of crazy fluctuations here. Saturday, of course, going to be our warmest day, likely pushing 10 degrees. A few places into the Fraser Valley may even get up to about 11. Sunday, though, the sun comes out. It'll be lasting around for Monday as well. And then come Tuesday into Wednesday, we go back into that normal sort of showery pattern. So I'll have more, obviously, next week to see how well this forecast pans out. <laughs> All right, Brett, thank you very much. You're welcome. And we will be back with more news right after the break.
For women, India is one of the most dangerous places in the world to live. About 100 cases of rape are reported there every day. The issue is a divisive one, and as Chris O'Neill Yates tells us, there is backlash and celebration tonight after four suspected rapists were killed. It could be mistaken for one of India's colorful festivals. Police honored with flowers and sweets, treated like heroes after taking suspects of a gang rape to the scene of the crime, purportedly to reenact it. They killed the four men. Police say they had tried to flee. The victim's sister is relieved. And I feel very happy for it. And I, I think this would be an example. And nobody will even think of doing it. And I think it's a record time they have to this. Priyanka Reddy was a 27-year-old veterinary assistant. Police say she was abducted on her way to work, gang-raped, murdered and set on fire. Her charred remains found under a bridge. Reddy's death prompted renewed protests across India, angry demonstrators demanding swifter justice for crimes against women. But not everyone is celebrating the death of her suspected rapists. Those people were in any case going to get um, hanging as a punishment for the, in the heinousness of their crime. But you cannot kill people because you want to. The groundswell against India's so-called rape culture began in 2012, when a young woman was raped by six men on a bus as it drove around Delhi. She later died from those injuries. That victim's father is also celebrating those police killings in Hyderabad. But human rights organizations are calling for an investigation to determine whether the police carried out extrajudicial killings. For many in India, though, justice has been served, even if it wasn't done in the courts. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, last night we showed you Uber's safety record in the United States with more than 3,000 reported incidents of sexual assault in Uber vehicles. The company won't provide Canadian numbers, but as Thomas Dagla reports, for many women, fearing the worst is a matter of course. For Uber, a company built on app-based convenience, an old-fashioned in-person visit to an office acts as a filter for problematic drivers. Just ask Zaina Teklu, who's signing up now. And there's a few documents that I have to, I had to submit in person online, so they, it's a very uh, strenuous background check they do. And no wonder. As more and more ride-hailing vehicles take to Canada's streets, more and more stories emerge of users falling victim to violence or harassment. Like a case in Ajax, Ontario, where a driver was charged after an alleged sexual assault and robbery. We never take Uber alone. We make sure we're always together, especially like late at night. I never really felt the need to be like, okay, I should watch myself, unless I was like maybe crazy drunk getting into my Uber. Uber's launched a PR operation, publishing the number of reported incidents in the U.S. and sharing this video. Sexual violence is more prevalent than we'd like to admit. But the company's not releasing Canadian data. Instead, it's been partnering with community groups here like the YWCA. Our job is working with survivors and actually bringing the voices of survivors into the room. Uber's reminding users to respect guidelines that apply to everyone in the car, and it's promoting its built-in tools in case of trouble. You can tap help within the Uber app to report. It's just a start, says this Ryerson professor. Every time I get in the car, I don't know who that person is at the wheel. I don't know what their experience is. I don't know how well they've been checked. They could be clear when they do the check, and then they could be involved in some kind of domestic assault or other forms of assault within a month. Assaults only occur in a tiny fraction of rides, but the perception remains. Ride hailing may not be as safe as it is convenient. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. To Alberta now, where five people are dead, three of them children, in a house fire. The fire taking place yesterday afternoon near Mayerthorpe. The home was destroyed by the blaze, according to officials, and today one person was found dead inside, but after a more extensive search, the bodies of four more people were also found. Officials say the dead are two adults and three children, an investigation now underway into what led to the fire. 
the music of Alanis Morissette and her album Jagged Little Pill are back rocking the stage, but now as part of a Broadway musical in New York. So how did the Canadian singer songwriter songs inspire the new production? We'll have that coming up. Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. If you've ever wondered what it's like behind the scenes here at CBC Vancouver, here's your chance. Go online and book a date to come in for a tour of our integrated newsroom. And our home can be your home. From concerts to galas to bar mitzvahs, our studio space can be transformed for any occasion and is available for rent. For more from CBC Vancouver, check us out online at cbc.ca slash bc. Okay, one of the biggest Canadian albums of the 1990s has come to life on Broadway. Jagged Little Pill premiered last night. It's based on Alanis Morissette's iconic album. Well, as Stephen D'Souza reports, it tells a brand new story. The musical Jagged Little Pill tells the story of a suburban family going through a number of issues, including the Me Too movement, school shootings, sexual assault, and opioid addiction. <laughs> I had a chance to talk to Alanis earlier and she said that this is something that when she was writing this and pouring her heart out 25 years ago, she never thought would happen. No, <laughs> I had no idea. I sat down with Vivek, Taiwari and Tom Kidd who did the music about eight years ago here in New York and they ran the idea up the flagpole and I thought, I'd be into that maybe, you know, and it took us eight years to find Diablo Cody and Diane Paulus and Tom Kidd and Larvie to choreograph and once it was a team I was so excited. Elena says that over the years she was approached about turning the album into a musical, but she wanted to make sure she approached it in the right way. Here's what she had to say about that. I took my time. I met some really incredible writers along the way. And until it was a big, giant yes, we just kept going and, and, and were really abundant thinking and very, very patient. Once Diablo Cody signed on and Diane Paulus and the whole team, 
I was beside myself. The album was an absolute phenomenon, and I knew all the songs, and so it was not um, it was not something I had to discover to write the show. You know, I, I kind of knew it. You know, when people talk about what that album meant to them, they don't just say like, oh, it's a great record, my favorite album of all time. They say, that record saved my life. That record pulled me through a, a traumatic period. It, it's, that record pulled me through a, a difficult divorce. You know, that's what people say about Jagged Little Pill. And I wanted to honor that. The show is already getting rave reviews, including from the New York Times. And next year, the celebration of the 25th anniversary of Jagged Little Pill includes the release of Alanis' first album since 2012, as well as a 31-date North American tour. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Okay, so if you're wondering what it's actually about, I am. Um, Alanis said that she didn't want it to be about issues that she dealt with. She wanted the whole play to be about issues that are happening now. So the Me Too movement, racism, oh. that kind of stuff, okay. using the songs to tie it all Boy, together. And some of them would definitely work for Absolutely, that. Absolutely, yeah. I remember she, said, she called her songs uh, at that time angry chick anthems yeah. or something like that. And just for the record, rain on your wedding day, it's, it's coincidence. It's not really irony. <laughs> Thanks. I just have to say that. I know you have a problem with that. I do. I'm um, glad you got to <laughs> I know. set that straight. Well, that looks good. The, uh, the musical looks fantastic. <laughs> uh, okay, finally tonight, the Bloedel Conservatory in Vancouver's Queen Elizabeth Park, as we mentioned last night, uh, turned 50 today. So tonight, we thought we'd turn back the clock to when the conservatory was open. Our CBC cameras were there. Here's a bit of what that day looked like and sounded like. I can see in the faces and the hearts of children and adults who will find in this wonderful place everything from a sense of civic pride to a renewal of their spirit, a renewal of their contribution to another human being. This enthusiasm seems to guarantee what has been our hope from the beginning, that this project would become a worthwhile addition to Vancouver's recreational domain. Only the passage of time will tell you how well you have wrought here. So perhaps my enthusiasm should be kept under decent control. Great place, conservatory. Really good 50 place. years, 50 yeah. years, well done. That's um, it for tonight's yeah. show, but mm -hmm. we wanted to remind you that you can still donate to the Food Bank. Today was CBC's Open House and Food Bank Day. That's how much we've raised right now, already surpassed last year's total. It's fantastic. Thanks to everybody who donated, and thanks to everybody who stopped by and, uh, and said hello and uh, had a chat with us here at uh, CBC Vancouver yeah. today. Nice to see you. We'll leave you some pictures of the day. And you can donate till January 1st. Have a good night.